so um let me let me begin then it's going to be about an hour and a half um i'm going to talk for about 45 minutes i guess but um please stop me okay yeah so welcome everyone this is uh, my talk about tblt gaming uh, my name is james york and boom uh, i work at a university in tokyo called Meiji university i've been there this is my second year there absolutely love it blessed love it love it love it uh, I, i'm also currently this year i think might be my final year as the editor-in-chief of the ludic language pedagogy journal and yeah this is the logo for llp this is the logo for major university so some caveats or some quick notes before we begin uh, basically i wanted to just mention that this what I'm going to be showing today, you may look at it and think, holy crap, I can't do I could never do that. It's like seven weeks on, on a game and all these different materials and stuff. Just wanted to make sure that you know that it wasn't made in a day. That I, in one paper that I wrote um, in 2021, I talked about the fact that this was iterated over many, many it, iterations. Um, it used to be not what it is now. So, yeah. And um, yeah, talking with a community that cares about you, um, it really helps. So verbalizing your, your problems, um, being in touch with the community of practice that are doing these things uh, is, 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 has been in, very inspiring for me. Another thing that I wanted to mention is that maybe not everything that you see in, in, in my talk today and how I've taught in my own context uh, is going to be applicable in your context. OK, so take what you can, do what you can, remix it and play with it. Um, there's a, a brilliant example of this. Um, from a member of the community called Fabio Spano, who took my model uh, and used it in a junior high school in, in Japan uh, to great success. Uh, so yeah, he he remixed it and, and made it his own. And again, yeah, iterate on things and just ask us, the LP community. We, we're here to help you uh, get the most out of uh, your and your students' interest in games uh, to help them towards uh, language learning uh, goals and curricular goals, essentially. Now, I want to try and avoid this as much as possible, death by PowerPoint. There are about 100 slides, but as you can see, they're going to go through quite quick. Hopefully, by the end of it, you'll be this girl down here. So another thing, if you have any questions throughout this talk, just raise your hand or someone just interrupt me and say, hey, James, shut up. Someone's got a question. I'm happy to field them. So I'm just going to dive straight in. Yeah, what is my TBLT gaming framework? OK, uh, I'm going to be looking at this framework uh, based on three keywords. The methodology that I use, in this case, TBLT, the materials that I created, and the mediations, the kind of help that I uh, do and the, the things that I do to, to help students as they're going through the, the framework. So these are the, the, uh, the this is the mm of LLP. Uh, me and Jonathan made a little zine about this, where we talked about methods, uh, about the, the why and the way and the goal uh, of, of your teaching. Uh, basically, yeah, like CLT, TBLT. Um, pedagogy of multiliteracies, remixing games, etc. So, what is your method? Uh, what are the materials that you create to help uh, you know students and to scaffold them towards their learning? So, things like worksheets, presentations, templates, uh, previous student work. This is one of the best materials you can have in your class. Show what students have done before. This will get your your students very um, interesting or not interested, but like it'll light a fire under their ass. Like, wow, my, my senpai did that. Like my my seniors did that. Um, so yes, previous student work is a fantastic material. Of course, another material that we're going to be using here are things like ludic elements, the games, the role plays, things like this, and uh, mediation. So what can we do as teachers? We can ask questions. We can explain things. We can model things, frame, guide, assist. Think about the verbs of what teachers can do in the classroom. Okay, so here's the model. Essentially, there are some pre-play activities, which uh, consist of things like reading the rule book to a game or thinking about vocabulary for the game that they're going to play, watching rules videos, uh, checking the rules as a group, test playing the game in the L1. This is what we do before we play. We say, okay, we've read the rule book. Seems a bit difficult. Let's try and play it. Let's play in our mother tongue, just to make sure that we've got the, the, the idea of the game down. This is fine. And then when they're playing the game, the, the big core of this model is that they record their gameplay, um, either audio or video. So they record what they do so that they can refer to it afterwards. Of course, they play the game in the L2 and take notes, well, as much as they can. Post-play activities. So after students record their gameplay, 
they transcribe it, which means that they listen to the audio, they listen to their voice, and they write down exactly what they said during the play session. In this way, they can analyze it to look for errors, uh, L1 usage, and um, it can inform grammar instruction as well. Uh, finally, they prepare to play a game. Okay, simple model. Before we play, play after play. What materials and mediation can you think of in here? So this is the method. What are the materials and what kind of mediation do you envisage? Yeah, there's going to be some questions to you guys as well. So feel free to just chime in. Go for it. I, I guess that maybe uh, for the free play activities, maybe a vocabulary notebook for the students would be useful. Yep. Something for them to write vocabulary in. Excellent. Uh, Martin mentioned the rule book itself is a material that they're referring to. The videos could be considered a material, a uh, multimedia, you know, asset. Anything else? The objects, pieces of the game that they interact with. Yep, indeed, tangible objects. These are materials that they're that they're using. Another one for pre-play might be uh, videos you can get online of people playing the games. One hundred percent. Yep. Just as a very small aside, I don't know how many of these there are going to be, but um, <laughs> this is one of the reasons that I I don't particularly enjoy or I don't really use educational games, I, games designed specifically for education. I've wrote about this in a, in a paper in the past, but the fact that a game like Among Us has a, a community around it means that if you search for it online, you're pretty much guaranteed to find some source material in the language that you're studying. You can find Indonesian players, you can find French players all playing the same game, which you can tap into as authentic material and all an educational game may not have a community around it that one can tap into to, to get like some some native or native like or you know that kind of expression so yeah uh mediation i mean i'm gonna i'm gonna go through it so we, we won't dwell too long here but um how does this link to uh, tblt if you are familiar with the tblt model it's basically it right pre-task task post-task post -task where we've got teacher-centered stuff, introducing the task, modeling the task, student-centered stuff when they're actually doing the task, and then post-task, again, student or teacher-centered, depending on how you want to do it, where we focus on language. I'll just go back one slide again so you can see. This is all fluency-based. This is all accuracy-based, right? We're looking, we're analyzing, we're doing grammar instruction, we're preparing to play again. This is a very simple visual overview of the model. So in the foot, this is each let this, each box is considered a lesson. So this lesson will be about learning how to play the game. The second lesson they'll play and record. Third lesson, uh, they'll analyze that recording and prepare to play a game. So that is repeated. They'll play second play session. They analyze the second play session, oftentimes comparing their performance based on the first play session and then do a small report. So one game, five weeks. We consider this the magic burger of teaching with games. What do I mean by that? Well, look, the the play is the patty, but it's not a burger without like the, the bread and the other stuff, right? So yeah, don't just play. Wrap that beautiful play in a bun and get yourself a magic burger of game-based teaching. Much better than a magic bullet. Games are not magic bullets, magic burgers. So yeah, the, the key point of teaching I think not, even if you're not using games is to just do it again. Don't just play once and forget about it. If you're going to reflect on it and think about the grammar and the language, you might as well use that in a second play session, right? If, you, if your uh, syllabus and your curriculum allows you that time. I wrote about this in a paper, 2020. It's your move. Why teaching with games should be like Vaporwave and not Nightcore, i.e. slow down, take your time to teach. Uh, so that's in a paper on the, the LLP website. This is another visual of the model. It's a little bit more advanced. Um, I've included this stage at the start where students actually take a full class to research the
the games that they might like to play. Like, hmm, I heard something about Apex. Maybe that's an interesting game. Let's research it. Or I heard James, Mr. York has a uh, hundred board games in his office. Let's research what games he has and choose one to play. So there's a whole research session before they start. Lesson one, again, how to play, play, analyze, replay, reanalyze, report. Uh, I'll skip all the extraneous text here. But you can just see that what kind of skills they're focusing on at, at each stage, speaking, thinking, uh, analysis and stuff like that. So now what I'm going to go show you is each stage of the model and the materials that are created and what students have, have produced based on um, being given um, the materials, essentially. So during the first stage, they'll read a rule book or they'll find important words for the game. This is um, a worksheet that students created. You can see that they've looked at vocabulary that they might need. Can anybody guess the game? based on the vocabulary. Or what kind of game even? It's not My Little Pony. It's not Counter-Strike. Carlos got it. It looks like Among Us, I would guess. This is Apex. Bill and Bluff. This is Apex. Carlos got it. Nice. So again, the, the materials that are created here is this part, right? I've created a worksheet where it focuses their attention on verbs, nouns, and adjectives. Teachers do this. This is what we do. This is what we bring. You can't just play. You've got to create materials to focus them, their attention. Again, another material here. I have students watch YouTube videos. Kevin was just mentioning this. Um, and this is a model of how to play. So again, in that task-based approach, if you model the task before they, they actually get do it themselves, jajan, here we go. So what I've had, what I've done here is, you know, given them a worksheet saying, watch YouTube, um, write down the time, what happened, and the words and the phrases that you heard. And then they can use this during their own gameplay session, right? Uh, they are talking about who went out first. I didn't leave first, though. Mm, left first. Okay, so they've got this idea of my leaving, who left, okay, etc. Again, I'm going to go pretty quick because I'm a bit of a stickler for time. And then again, in the pre-play learning phase of the, the of this model, they will play the game in the native language. So in my case, it's Japanese. They'll play the game in Japanese. Excellent. No problem. Because after they've played, they'll collect or they'll, they'll try and reflect on the words that they said, translate them in English to then use in their actual play session that's coming up. Does that make sense? So we use the L1 to scaffold thinking about the L2. So I guess in, in modern parlance, this is an idea of translanguaging, if you like. So they'll, they'll play, write their words down on the worksheet, translate it into English for the, for the following session. I think that's all I've got. Yeah, okay, this is just a photograph of students uh, looking at rule books and thinking about how to play the game. And again, authentic text, right? Um, again, a smaller side, I asked students just this week, um, like, what's more difficult, the entrance exam to university or this rule book? And they were like, totally this rule book. And I was like, why is that? And their answer was very, very obvious, uh, if you think about it. But they said that, well, the entrance exam, we don't really need to read it. We just skim it and figure out the answers as quickly as we can. But this, we must understand it uh, or else we, we, we can't play the game. I was like, yeah, there you go. See, so people think that playing games is just, you know, easy and fun, but it's hard work. And they totally agreed. So, yeah. Uh, Apex in Japanese, eh? All right, so question, we're going to skip this because I'm sure you're not not that stupid. What skills are students focusing on in this phase? Passive learning, kind of reading and listening skills, yeah. Critical thinking as well, I guess. Uh, then they play the game, and I'm just going to show a bunch of photographs of students playing games. These are the kinds of games that we play in class. Resistance Avalon. I'm not even going to explain them. If you're interested, check, ask me afterwards or ask the community. But Resistance Avalon code names uh, you'll also notice this is just they made it themselves cheap don't worry about digital games you can use any old game right code names pandemic burgle brothers dead of winter big heavy game serious students choose this for their fourth game of the semester mysterium mafia de cuba munchkin lots of reading intrigue hella good backstabbing game speakeasy Full class role play, 
in a speakeasy in the 1920s, trying to figure out who the cops and the robbers are by using secret passwords. Fantastic game. Two rooms and a boom. Beautiful game. Uses two physical spaces. Love it. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, key point. Game literacy is key to teaching with games. You're like, oh yeah, I'd love to teach with games. I don't know anything about games though. Uh, yeah, that's going to be tricky. <laughs> So the more you know about games, the more you know what might be useful in your own context. This is just a, a picture from my office. Um, it's nothing on Jonathan DeHaan's office, by the way. <laughs> um, I don't just use board games, though. Um, since the COVID pandemic, I had to shift my teaching online, like most of us. Uh, students were on their PCs, and we took classes on Discord together, and we couldn't play board games anymore. So I opened up the game, opened up the class to digital games. Any ideas of what games might have been popular? Ah, uh, that's a good one. Minecraft. It wasn't that popular, you know. Fortnite. I had nobody play Fortnite. Among Us was, yes, definitely the most popular. I had two or three groups. Roblox. No, nobody played Roblox. Yeah. Completely regarding the games of literacy point it was the biggest issue we had getting Minecraft education into. Oh, yeah. Cloudy here, he used to work for um, uh, Microsoft working on, no, he worked for Mo Yang working on Minecraft education. So, yeah. Among Us, Minecraft, Apex, yes. No MMORPGs. No M MMOR. Oh, actually, we did. We had Final Fantasy fourteen. Uh, these were the kind of popular choices we had. Um, Apex Legends, uh, online card games like Werewolf. There's a really good site for that. Among Us was very popular. And uh, this game, which you might know of, Smash Brothers. I'm going to focus on this one later because I think this is an absolutely beautiful example of how this framework uh, can work with any game. So keep it in mind. Put a pin in it. James is going to talk about Smash Brothers later. Nobody played Hearthstone, Jake. So after they've played the game, they've recorded it. Uh, their homework is to transcribe the audio. This is a question that I do want to have a little brief pause on. So what do you think the benefits of transcribing, i.e. listening to the, the gameplay audio and writing it out? What, what could the benefits of that be? You're forced to look back and reflect on the reality of the gameplay, not what you experienced. Could you unpack that a little bit more, Cloudy? Uh, reflective practice and self-check. Could you unpack that a little bit, uh, James? What do you mean by self-check? Uh, it's Jim, actually. Yeah, hey, hey, Jim. Jim works with me at Meiji. I'm sure he's very happy to. Uh, noticing what was said. Yes, noticing is a good word. That's very SLA. That's very uh, TBLT, isn't it? Noticing. Raven, what was not said. Yes, that's beautiful. Right. Anything else you can think of? Increase awareness of what? So it can be off. Oh, well, I'm yeah, 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 go for it. Hi. Yeah, yeah, go for it. <laughs> Instead of typing, it'll, it'll take me uh, less time. Love so it. I never thought, I mean, I, I use game, different types of games, but I, I never thought of recording it. I love that idea. Hmm. Um, and having the, like, I've, I've taken videos, but I've never actually had the kids listen to that. But I know mm. it will increase their awareness of their language. And when you transcribe, you sometimes have to listen multiple times. Um, so it could uh, increase awareness of grammatical structures, of yes. word choice, uh, uh, vocabulary choice. Um, I think when you're in the game and when you're playing, you don't always notice these things. because 100%. You're, that's you're, it. Yes. That is it. You have no cognitive, uh, what is the word, um, space to even think about accuracy. You're like, oh my God, the enemy's coming. Go there. You know, and, and maybe even your L1 pops out. You're like, yeah, boy, how do you go? And then you're like, okay, I've just spoke the L1, didn't even notice. So yeah, uh, Yale, is that how I pronounce your name? Yael. Yael. Okay, Yael. Thank you. Yeah, that, that is perfect. Um, so that's good from the student side. How about from the the the, the practitioner, the, the teacher side of things? There are some benefits for us too. 
Well, similar benefits. It's like an assessment in a way. I use games oftentimes as an assessment to see who mm -hmm. got it, who didn't get it. Um, and when you're you're in the classroom, you can't always notice everyone. But if you have a recording, that's that's a great way to assess. Yes. To, where you have to focus your next instruction. Yes, you can see who's performing well or not as a teacher, right? You can say, okay, well, this guy's not said anything. This guy's messing up his um, adverbs all over the place. Uh, this guy's, um, you know, not using the past tense. So it's great for us. Yes, again, nice one, Kevin. Uh, formative for planning your next lesson. Error correction. Yes, Martin. Wicked. Very good. So I guess the core of this model is not actually the TBLT part, but the the transcribing and doing it again. But yeah, okay. All right, so let me show you some examples of my students' uh, transcriptions. Ba-boom. Um, yeah. Chen, okay, ready, ready. So we cannot play rank game. Go, go, go. Stop using PlayStation 4. Why? So long. It takes us so long to match, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we have this uh, example of student transcription of them playing Apex. Uh, this is a, an Among Us one where, again, they've uh, they've faithfully transcribed the Japanese as well. I found dead body in weapon. I saw red and green and white in admin. Maybe red is sus. Okay, this is a word that they did not know before they started to play this game. But of course, they found out about it because of the community around uh, Among Us. You'll notice here that uh, I haven't showed the comments at the side, but that this was done on a Google document where everybody was looking at it together and leaving comments and trying to correct their, their, their language as they need to. So I guess this is Apex as well, yeah. No, no, this was a Call of... No, not Call of Duty. What is it? CSGO, uh, Counter-Strike. Uh, and and they're, uh, they're actually talking about a play session after having played. So they're saying, okay, well, what happened? Enemy team rush B. Okay, so we go to site B, blah, 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 blah. Okay. This is one from a game called The Quiet Year, which is a collaborative story-making game. Uh, very chill RPG. So you can see that... This is one student's single utterance. Outside of this community, there is like dangerous, yeah, dangerous tigers. So that sometimes people belongs to this community was attacked by tigers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that the, the point here that I'm going to make is language output can vary significantly based on the game used and the student proficiency, right? So if you're playing something that's super twitchy like Apex, you're going to have very short um, uh, utterances. But if you're playing a game that's more relaxed, and um, focused on story creation, then maybe you're going to have longer, um, more complex expressions being used. Uh, when they are transcribing and reflecting, do you also give them focus points? That's a great question. I do not. Uh, what I do do, though, which we'll look at now, the analysis stage, once they have the transcription, we do do a lot of kind of um, focus. So first of all, we do error correction. So I give them a whole talk about lexical errors, morphological errors, syntactic errors, and they try to find errors and correct them themselves on the Google Doc. So that's the first one. Another thing that we do, this is my mediation. Um, all of this was in inside the transcription. I said, okay, stop. Let's talk about this for a while. One of the kids, uh, Haruto, he wanted to learn about if. So I say, okay, let's let's try and create some if sentences down here. Uh, so like, we will win. If this, then we will. So, and then they also wanted to learn about, uh, they, they heard someone say, on my six. So we, we tried to like look at what that meant. So a lot of grammar work, I go to each group and help them with their individual grammar problems, which is not the most efficient use of time. If everyone was playing the same game, I could just give one, you know, block of grammar transcription. But as a teacher, I find this quite fun, quite exciting to go to each group and go okay what's your problem what are you having problems with show me um this is another one so you can see i wrote this text in line in their um in their transcription to show well you're not using should here you know why don't you focus on using this in your next play session we did some mediation grammar work on discord so this is all like within a discord we had a class discord at the time and I also prepared some grammar work. Uh, during the start of the year, they all play the same game, the two rooms and a boom. So I thought, well, this game, they're going to use if. Like, if the bomber is there, then we should keep the president here. Like, this idea of using if. So I created, like, a whole worksheet about if. Like, how do we use if? Let's look at it together. 
So sometimes you can do full class grammar work. Um, you can even use a textbook, I guess. Uh, again, this is another one that I prepared in advanced. Okay, so it's question formation. And I mean, I guess you couldn't do this now because of chat GPT. But at the time, this was like a couple of years ago when uh, Google Translate was like the main thing that students used. Um, this was a typical Japanese sentence that they'd need to use in the game. I knew this. I threw it straight into Google Translate. And this is the sentence that came out. So it's kind of like a way to say, guys, if you use Google Translate, it's not going to work. So can you actually use your brains and figure out what the correct English is going to be? So this is something that I pre-prepared and thought that they would probably need. And so then they could talk about it together and go, oh, yeah, OK, how are we going to do this based on James's um, grammar instruction prior? Uh, another thing this perhaps um, relates to y Yael's uh, talk about, do I focus them? Uh, I, I asked them, like, like what, what do you need to improve? Look at your transcription. What is the problem? How can you improve it this lesson? What are you going to do? So yeah, that's another way to, to focus them on, on this. And all of this work, oh, this is another great one. This is actually inspired by um, uh, the colleague I just mentioned, uh, Fabio, Fabio Spano, who had students create situational quizzes to help students, you know, image training is kind of what we say in Japan, right? Like, if, if you're in this situation, what would you say? So they create a quiz, say, so okay, you, you are here, you reported the red body, before you called, the lights were down, you were entering admin, you are the crew member. So the idea is maybe White is going to say, oh, I saw Blue next to the red body, I think he's self-reporting. So how do you explain this situation? So it's like a, a way for students to think about what they're going to do. And here are all the answers, we'll skip them, but yeah, I, I've made this a quiz, so everyone made a quiz question and everybody answered everybody else's quiz question. Thank you, Fabio, wonderful idea, and I, I use it a lot. All of that, if you just ended the class there, what a waste. you got to replay it. Now they've got all this work on grammar and, and things that they can take to their next gameplay session, play it again and record it again. Uh, and this is actually where I... Um, assess them. So I go to each group and I say, right, this is your second gameplay session. This is your speaking test. So I, I, I give them a rubric and I tell them that I'm going to grade them based on the rubric. They reanalyze re their performances, often, oftentimes comparing the performances. They give themselves a self-assessment, uh, compare the trans transcriptions. So what errors did you have? Did you use it correctly this time or are you still using it incorrectly? So just an idea to focus them on. Did you actually learn anything? Did you actually correct your errors? Again, I have all of these documents um, and worksheets available afterwards that I can share with you for, for use in your own context or pick and choose as you wish. Finally, a small report stage, uh, a la the TBLT framework. So we have students, you know, just give a little presentation about what they did, what they liked, what they didn't like. So this is the game name. Um, this is a good point. Oh, this is how to play. Uh, this is the good points. These are the bad points. So a small presentation. Mysterium. These are the rules. This is the aim. Good points, bad points. Now, after all of this, I consider students kind of masters of, of, of playing the game. They, they were learners of the game, but now they've kind of mastered it. They've played it twice. They know all about the grammar and they've watched native speakers play it, or you know, at least uh, English speakers play it. So I used to have them be creators where they'd create game reviews or they'd make their own how to play videos or they'd create gr grammar guides for other students. But that was in a previous version of the model. I'm going to skip it for today. Oh, wait, what about the Smash Brothers team? Okay. It is impossible to play and speak at the same time. This game is so twitchy. It is impossible, even in the first language. It's a fighting game. Even if you spoke, you'd be telling your partner what you're going to do and you'd get kicked anyway. So I said, guys, whoops, you're going to get zero. You're going to get zero points in your assessment if you can't play this, if you can't do something in English with this game. Oh, no. What's going to happen? We found a solution. Don't play, but talk about it. Just talk about the game that you like. This was chef kiss. Let me show you this. So what they did is one of the students plays Link. He created a tier list 
a matchup list of like, well, who's Link weak against and who is Link strong against? And then they just talked about it. So, so okay, how about Simon? Steve, uh, Simon's down side tilt to Kirby Ataru. And so we're talking about like, you know, this is very specialized language right here. Side tilt, down tilt. If Kirby squats, Kirby's hitbox is very thin. Hitbox? I didn't teach them that, you know, they had to look it up themselves. Simon's side tilt cannot hit, can easily hit the attack. And Molotov don't hit Kirby. So they had to check afterwards that actually Simon's uh, Simon's down B is not Molotov. It's actually holy water, et cetera, et cetera. So they're just talking about it. Uh, the second transcription, this is another fun, a really good example from this group again. So what they did is they brought the switch in, they set it up, they, they didn't play, they didn't fight each other, they just talked about it. Look here, so back air's repetition, blast range, weaker. If cloud's repetition effect is high, cloud cannot kill the opponent. Uh, blast, back air only, et cetera, et cetera. But here, what they did is they were like, um, mainly back air, also limit break. And then the question, dash attacks blast percentage? So they actually open the switch and they're like, okay, let's set DK to 130. Let's see if it kills him. Ah, no, does not kill. Let's set it to 140. Ah, does not kill. Okay, so they're actually testing their hypotheses in the game and then talking about it outside the game. I just thought this was wonderful. As a Smash fan as well, you know, I had to, I had to enjoy it. So. so yeah, even if you can't play games in the classroom, you can have students talk about it, about their hobby, about the thing that they're interested in. Okay, this is much quicker than I was expecting. Wonderful, we're getting really through this. We're gonna have lots of time for discussion and we, you can tell me all about your own context, which is good because you don't wanna listen to me for an hour. Uh, so no, I'm gonna talk about this last thing, which is something that I, I've been calling pro gamer assessment. As I mentioned um, in the model, the speaking test happened during the second play session where I'd physically go to a group or I'd go into a Discord room where students were playing and I'd, lis I'd listen to them for like 10 minutes and assess their speaking ability during the second play session. But one day, now this is the impetus, right? One day, this message came up on Discord. What if I die when York comes? They're going to get zero points. They, they won't be able to talk because they can't speak when they're dead. I was just like, yes, okay, I need to fix this. So I, this is a reflective diary that I kept. I'm just copy pasting from the diary. But I was like, yeah, hmm, this guy, right? Hero said this, you know, students should be given the opportunity to submit a best play reel. At the time, I was watching something called Last Chance You on Netflix, which is about, uh, uni uh, not university, like college football teams. And I was watching these this college football team and they were making videos of like their their performance over the season. And I was like, that's a great portfolio assessment right there. Um, so I thought, well, how about students, if, they, if they're put in charge, if they're given the uh, responsibility of showing me, evidencing their learning, right? So something like students record gameplay, they were already doing this. They select three or five of their best performances using English. They make a little MP3 or a video, and then they submit it to me like a portfolio. Or they also create an explanatory doc saying why they chose that clip. All right. So I'm just going to skip that. So the, the, the model now looks like this. So we've got the learn, the play, the analysis. Uh, oh, that's, 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 that's not the right order. <laughs> Should go here. Lesson, you don't do lesson five before lesson four, guys. Okay. Just keep that in mind. Uh, and so, yeah, we can basically, you can go through this multiple times if you like. Oh, wow. I never noticed that until now. How, how bizarre that I didn't notice that. Yeah. But at the end of the model, then we have like a montage making uh, session where they look through all of their transcriptions, look through their recordings and try and find areas where they, they really perform their best in terms of like accuracy, fluency and complexity. So what is a montage video? Now, being a big Smash fan, this is a montage video. You can see it, by the way, right? Can't hear anything, though. Oh, not sure how to get sound coming out. Ma. The point is, yeah, 
not full game, just clips of really pro play, right? You get the idea. Um, Shut up, Tom. <laughs> My son's watching. He's like, yeah, that's a good video. Okay. Shh. So the point was that there's an intro, there's a little bit of buffer, there's a performance, a little bit of buffer, then another intro like this. So I made a guide for students. Uh, I said, okay, this is how you make videos. Uh, I want you to fill in, again, a material. I want you to fill in what happened, the transcription, bold the part that you're proud of, give me your reflection, and tag it with some hashtags. So this is a clip from a particular student. <clears throat> he was knocked down. No, his friend was knocked down. And he said, uh, so he helped his friend get up. His friend said, thanks. There is fighting now. And the student said, get up before I kill you myself. And he was proud of this because he'd found it uh, on an Apex video or something that he'd seen a, of a, an English speaker saying. He was like, yeah, I'm really proud. I could use cool English. Right. So this is what he submitted to me. Uh, here's another example, just, you know, long sentences where they're, they're trying their best to use English. Uh, again, bolded. Um, I think Salter is imposter because Salter is many sus for me. No, no, I think Salter is imposter. Last time I was in the corridor between reactor and security, so I didn't kill Teal. So this idea of like a very long sentence, right? Using fluent English. Just some more examples. Uh, good. Uh, I, I allowed them to use Japanese to, to do the reflection as well. Here. So I did a good choice in the game while speaking English, et cetera. Uh, then was able to use on my ping. So I was proud of that. <laughs> uh, this is some feedback from the students saying that it was a fair assessment. Like in the last game, I was grateful because I did not talk that much in terms of quantity. So having them be, be in charge of their own uh, best play real was 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 fairer basically i think it's great because the teacher can't keep track of everything happening in a one-shot test Oish. uh some negative comments it was hard to choose scenes like it does take extra time uh, it was easier for me to do a one-shot test with the teacher present like just less work right york comes they speak done this is the one that that's, you, we really need to keep keep in mind. I questioned whether video editing skills should be required in an English class. A minimum level of skill is certainly necessary, but I felt that there was no need to give that part of the skill any preference in English classes. Fair enough. This student did not want to learn how to edit English. He just wanted to edit videos. He wanted to learn English more. I also had a student just submit their best plays in terms of gameplay, not language. I was like, no, no, you got the wrong end of the stick. My my bad for calling it that, but you know. Um, there are some videos on YouTube. I have to admit, this one is particularly ridiculously good. Look, look at the start. Best play real montage. Created subtitles and everything. Uh, picture in picture. The kid just went really wild with it. Okay, so that's just an example. There's a couple on my YouTube uh, channel uh, of students' uh, best play. But actually now, I oops, how can I just go to the next slide? That's no good. There. Actually, I don't require students to make videos anymore. I just have them create a Google Doc with their best clips. Like these are the parts where I spoke the most. Like just take their transcriptions and show me. You want to learn more about this model? I got three papers in LLP on it. The first one is in 2019. Uh, at that time, it was called Cotaba Rollers. Uh, I talked about the whole myth, the whole thing here we just talked about, but in a lot more detail. Open access, baby. Journal, journal. Uh, it's open access. In 2020, I, I did a kind of more analytical study on it, looking at um, comparing students' gameplay session one and gameplay session two for increases in um, language accuracy. And uh, yeah, yeah, there was a statistical significance, significant difference between play one and play two, right? So the magic burger worked. I also recently published a chapter in this book called Pro Gamer Inspired Speaking Assessment. I might have some copies lying around somewhere if you're uh, interested in that. Does the method work? Yeah. 
if you want students to improve their speaking ability, yeah, man, they took the responsibility for their own learning, acquired some 21st century skills based on a pre and post test. Output accuracy was significantly improved. Students felt a sense of belonging, especially during COVID when they were working in small groups and being in charge of their own learning. Motivation increased, same paper. Let's look at the montages that the students made, right? It's beautiful. What have I not talked about today? Look at that, 40 minutes. I said 45 minutes, didn't I? I didn't mention students' interest or lack of interest in games. This is something we can talk about, right? Some students really like it, some are not so keen. Uh, intercultural communication. I actually had students as a exit task in, in terms of task-based uh, learning parlance. The exit task was for them to actually go and play the game that they chose with um, English speakers online. So I invited English speakers to the Discord and their exit task was, can you successfully play this game with, with quote unquote, you know, native English speakers? I didn't talk about Reddit and tapping into gaming communities on Reddit. I didn't talk about learning English culture and slang through YouTube video watching, although we did have a few examples of it. Probably some more things that I missed too. Could you do this? How, why, why not? That's it, 45, 43 minutes. Maybe it's a bit fast, but yeah. Feel free to uh, put your mics on and stuff and let's, uh, let's chat. Okay, Robert, yeah, go for it. Um, when we were looking at using games in, in, in our English center, the biggest, the biggest issue was um, uh, like hardware and DRM. So, so like Among Us is pretty accessible and cheap, but um, you know, like we'll take Smash Brothers for instance. They have to have a Switch, or they have to have a Wii. They yep. have to have a TV, and you know, schools don't necessarily want to buy that. And then you go to PlayStation, you have to have Twist Plus, and you got to have Steam, and you got to have a laptop. So, yeah, how 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 do how do you deal with DRM? accounts, hardware. Yep. Have students bring them in. You want to play Smash Brothers? Bring your Switch in. Or, like I showed in uh, the video, just find a bunch of board games that, that don't break down, that don't require expensive hardware. Uh, Intrigue is a fantastic backstabbing game. Um, you just print it and play it. Code names you can use scraps of paper. You can play Two Rooms and a Boom with a deck of cards. You can play One Night Werewolf with a deck of cards. So you're doing you're doing video games and board games in the same class? Yeah, but um so if I just briefly outline the 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 year syllabus. The first two games are things that I've chosen because I want everybody on the same page to to go through the 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 framework which I just showed. I want them to go through it and 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 understand it as a class. Then in the second semester, I say, right, now it's on you. You can play anything as long as you um, can show me that you can speak English while doing it. So that's when they go off and then say, well, I'm going to do Final Fantasy 14. Like the Apex groups, they didn't play in class. They just did a lot of analysis in class and then played at home. That's how you get around it. Offer lots of options. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. You choose. That, that It's like, you want to play Apex? Find someone that wants to play Apex with you. I've had students be groups of one. I had one kid wanted to play League of Legends. Nobody else knew how to play it. Yeah. And so he just did it by himself. I was like, cool, go for it. Yeah. Uh, right, Kevin. Yeah, I was just wondering uh, the time frames. Uh, you said yeah. a year long class or a semester class. You play four games in a Correct. year long class. So Correct, two yes. each semester. Yes, and that's then right. For me, anyway, the the transcription uh, mm -hmm. when I transcribe stuff, it takes you know for five minutes of speaking, it takes an hour to transcribe it. Yep. Uh, yeah, it just mm -hmm. asks the students to do. Yeah. How 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 much of a chunk do you ask them to do? Great, that's Half a great question too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I say, well, take for example, the the a lot of the games that we play are things like One Night Ultimate Werewolf. It's a ten minute long game, so I say, mm -hmm. okay, maybe you've got three games worth. Choose one split it between this between all of you and so you do like two minutes each mm. uh, another option is for example the, the game that i'm playing right now is called two rooms and a boom uh there's 30 people playing at once it's impossible to transcribe everyone so i say just transcribe yourself that's okay. another option yeah uh -huh. 
Uh, we got uh, Kelsey. Yeah, maybe this isn't a problem for you because you have university students, but do you have a problem with profanity? Ah, that's a very good question. So if it comes up, I'm very happy to teach them about it. And it inevitably comes up. I don't know how, how you how how the high school or junior high school would feel about that, right? Yeah, right now, Jar in my first years, um, we were playing a game and we heard some f bombs and all this uh -huh. other stuff. So we're like, mm, okay. Thing is, though, right? It can't be a prude about it. If you go online, if you go on Twitter or whatever, you're gonna hear it. Right. I think it's important to teach, right? And there's actually one teacher at my university. Well, again, it's a university, but her whole class is on English profanity. It's like, what's good swearing? What's bad swearing? <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know. Is anyone else working in a, in a lower than university context? And how do you deal with profanity? Yeah, I work with the elementary and middle school, and I'm in an American school. An American school, so they're real prudes. You can't say anything. <laughs> you can just you can't have a lesson on that. You can't. I mean, they. I don't hear a lot of swear words, and I teach my Israeli students even not to say shit. Mm -hmm. In the spell, you say it on a regular basis, but like, mm -hmm. no, here it will not be approved. You mm -hmm. can get. So it's it's very cultural. I think uh, from different cultures, you use swear words more or less. Mm. And in my case, I have to teach them to use it less. Yeah. Uh, I've had good. set expectations at the beginning, you know, with my high school students to say like, <clears throat> listen, we know that you can swear and, and I can swear and, you know, guys, we could swear. But for this, imagine, you know, for this, you're talking to your grandmother or something and or consider the audience so that, you know, for now, just don't swear when we're doing this. Just address it from yeah. the game. Yeah. Mm. Warn them about it if you don't want them to do it. Maybe you could get them to notice, Kelsey, and say, hey, look, where, where are the swear words in here? Yeah, we're not going to do that. <laughs> like a consciousness raising thing. Uh, Robert, you want to go? Sorry, quick question. Go for um, it. I love that you use Among Us. Like when I was trying to think of games to use, that was one that I thought would be perfect. Another one that I came across was we were here have you uh -huh. ever, have you or anybody ever tried that that video was we were here the montage video it's it's a two oh that was i knew it looked familiar okay yeah cuz yeah that one i have never played it i've only read about it but i figured like i thought that would be perfect for students because you it's have good. to communicate yeah. it's a two player but, one so i mean yeah. again, that that was that was a choice game so it was something that they chose to play i told them i was not going to buy it for them i think actually yeah. we were here is free to play but uh on Steam, I think the first one is free. Exactly. Yeah, that was the one that they were playing. Uh, that group also went on to play Hand Simulator, which was wild. Hand, hand Simulator. Not Absolutely Surgeon Hand. Wild. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I like your idea of like you can play Apex or you can play like a Twitch game like mm. like like Smash. You just have to find a way to use English, like tele teleprompt it or, or talk about it. So that's a great idea that I didn't think about when I was brainstorming how to use games. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. Nice one. Come on, hit me. Where, where's where's the hard questions? Well, maybe I maybe I can ask you a question. Okay, ja, Yael. Yeah. It's not a hard question, but um I <laughs> I want I want to have two questions. One, um, do you have also beginner level students that you work with? Absolutely, and yeah. Yeah. And um, like, which games do you use? I don't know if you have listed like a, a list of games in which vocabulary or grammatical structures mm -hmm. like better taught through those games. Okay. Would... So in fact, this whole model came out because I needed to take so much time to get students to be able to output the, the target language. It just took, I couldn't just say, right, every week we're going to play a different game. It just didn't work. There was no way that they could keep up with that pace. So I had to slow things down again, the vaporwave style, slow things down, do a lot of intense grammar work, um, you know, look at um, other people playing, answer a lot of questions, lots of materials. It just took a long time because my students, although they had experience in junior high school and high school, they were still pretty low level. So that answers the first question. There was another part though, right? Oh, for beginner learners, what's a good game? I think a great gateway game um, is something like Spyfall. If you're allowed to use mobile phones in the classroom, I'll just chuck it in chat here. It's called Spyfall. 
uh, or something like 20 questions even, you know. Why not just play 20 questions? You don't need anything to play that. Um, or Insider, like these games that are very focused on asking questions. Um, yeah, and you can play Spyfall for free online. It's a good game. Yeah, I use Guess Who and 21 Yeah, questions. yeah, yeah. Guess Who. Is. Yeah. And then Remix Guess Who. Isn't that, I think Jonathan knows when it's like dinosaurs or something, dinosaur party. Again, uh, just to reply to Kelsey slightly, um, you, I think you do know Fabio, right? Oh, the Fabio Spano. Yeah, he he's had some good success with this in the junior high school context. So I think, but there is a big barrier there, a cultural barrier. Maybe Jara as well uh, has some, some input on this, but... As an ALT, you're quite limited sometimes in in what you you can achieve in the classroom um, because there's a, a, a textbook or they're, they're they're not doing anything that's related to communication as such, but more towards like writing and test taking. So I understand the pain, but I'd love to help you know um, you break through and and do something cool. Yeah, Jake, you got a question? Yeah, uh, thanks for the talk, James. Uh, I just wondered, did you ever have a chance to try out any TRPGs, tabletop role-playing games? So I personally haven't. You know, it's not my thing. I just, I'm not into that. And so I, that possibly reflects the kind of games that I use. You also notice there's not a lot of narrative games here because my class is on communication skills. So I, I'm trying to get students speaking, you know, like in the CLT fashion. But um, one group did play a TRPG. It was a Japanese one. It was called Udon. TRPG. It was like you roll dice and got ingredients. And then the whole part, of, it was a very short one. They had to sell their particular udon. So it's like they got all these ingredients. Each person's got their own udon ingredients and then they have to sell it to each other. And then they choose the best one. It was pretty wild because the ingredients are like snails and toenail clippings and stuff like that. So. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I guess uh, that just kind of goes to speak. One of your one of your main points was, you know, if you want to mm. use games in your mm. classroom, you really have to love them yourself. You have to be passionate about them. Yeah. So, yeah, cool. Thanks. Martin, what you got? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I've talked I've talking, I've spoken to James about this already at a lot of length, but I, I am interested in what other people um, mm. think. Maybe they have something <clears throat> to add. So I'm a preschool teacher. I, I work with really young kids and I'm doing, I'm starting my dissertation soon on using games in the classroom. Um, the class I'll be working with mostly four and five-year-olds. So I really like a lot of James' ideas and his framework um, that he's shown. I'm just wondering, does anybody think it's even possible to do some of these kind of activities with such a young age? Like, I do want to try it, but I'm wondering, is it, is it a big mistake? Am I am I biting off way more than, <laughs> than I can handle? You can't, they can't probably can't transcribe for a start. No, no, that's not <laughs> probably can't hold a pencil, right? Mm. But just doing it again, right? Repeating and I don't know. Any, anyone got I was going to say my experience yeah. with um, that age learner is that if something is fun, they will 100% want to do it again. And in fact, I think that's a huge mistake that teachers often make is it's fun okay we're moving on to the next thing mm. you know why are we not repeating the fun the fun <laughs> thing you know so i think it'll just yeah be finding the right the sort of right game okay yeah to play. I, I i have a i have a whole bunch of games that i use regularly with them that that they mm -hmm. already know how to play 20 questions bingo you know variations mm. on snakes and ladders things like that so the the games themselves is not really the issue i'm mostly worried about the kind of data collection um and again i spoke with james a lot about this um how to you know if, if they're older students you can do surveys you can transcribe you can do all kinds of stuff with them but with the young really young kids you know i i can i can get permission to record them on video but beyond that it, it is a bit limited that's kind of where my worry is hmm do it again ramp up the difficulty see if there's any change in uh, output or attitude or something like this perhaps mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if you're looking for a study yeah I actually had a student uh, who graduated last year, and I, I was teaching uh, a seminar, 
uh, which is, you know, and it was all about games and they each had their own projects. And this student went back to her, uh, the Yochian that uh, the kindergarten that she kindergarten. graduated from, and she made a game for the kids there. And it was just a, it was a really simple game that would teach them uh, how to say numbers, I think, in, in English. And she collected data from them by just like giving them a little paper and having them circle, uh, you know, whether or not they could notice what was in the game after the fact. And it seems like they did all right on it, but I don't know. I think they had a lot more fun, you know, obviously playing the game and then like, what is this quiz thing that you're giving me? <laughs> so there's probably better ways to do it, but yeah, anyway. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Something to think about. Mm -hmm. You can just make your own games or make your own little things, maybe. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's got lots. I've seen them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, if anybody ever has any idea, I know James had mentioned, um, what was it? La not like learn. Yeah. Yeah. Language, language related episodes. Language related episodes. Yeah. So I'm, yeah. I'm looking into that. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I'd like to see. Uh, go ahead, Yao. You muted yourself, by the way. Sorry, I was just going to say to Martin, I'd love to be in touch with you and hear about your games and exchange. I have some games that might be good for younger kids as well. Oh, sure, definitely. Thank you. Beautiful. Look at that handshake right there, virtual handshake. Um, I was just going to say that Jar and I used to teach at elementary school, and I'm always a bit surprised at their level of understanding for games and how that's increased over the years i guess because they have exposure to smartphones and things like that so my kids would be like do you play apex I'm like you're in grade one <laughs> <laughs> so you know i think they can handle a lot more games than we think mm. but mm -hmm. yeah wild uh let me see I know people are leaving now. James, uh, I know I, I saw you briefly. You asked me a question on Discord. Do you want to remind me what that was? Oh, the uh, uh, Secret Hitler one. Secret Hitler one. Yeah, what was it? Let me just open Discord. Um, so we tried Secret Se Hitler was on Tuesday in one of my classes. Uh -huh. um, and I think you made me realize I'm, I'm rushing way too fast with these games. <laughs> right. But they had a good time. They were using a lot of English, but it is uh -huh. a bit uh, aimless. Right. Um, but looking at your framework now, honestly, it, I think aimless can be okay if you add that reflective and kind of analyzation part into it. So mm. I'm not as worried as I was when I wrote that question earlier. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, but um, is there any way we could focus on, say, like a, a grammar point or like opinion giving or uh, any kind of aspect we would like to introducing to our class do you have any suggestions for focusing practice inside a game that's not made for english language or language learning yeah so again i think it, it it's all about what you know and what kind of goals you're going for for example that uh, the idea of the i think i sent you the the quiet year worksheet that i created yeah. which was all about using creative language and increasing their, their use of uh adverbs and adjectives and uh, think about narrative voice and things like that so yeah it depends what you what you what you're aiming for like which game that you choose really and then focusing on that again like i mentioned uh, i focus on if in a particular game because i knew that that was right. going to be something that came up so you can totally just go okay well i guess they're going to use this in this grammar point in this game therefore i'm going to teach it after the fact so yeah gotcha cool yeah, man. thanks man oh okay all right, we're coming up to the hour. Uh, I'm happy to uh, to call it quits anytime. Uh, eight, that was that's an hour. I don't want to keep you uh, too long, but um, we'll, we'll go a few more questions here, I guess. Uh, Secret Hitler, yeah, it's a, it's a there's a there's a version with Trump actually. I don't think I've got it at home anymore. But the Hitler card, there's a, there's a um, did I even record it? I did record it. Whew. There's a Trump sticker for it. Yeah. Is it like mafia or something where you're trying to guess who the bad guy is? Is that it? Oh, you mean so, like Secret Hitler? Secret Hitler is like, it's like Resistance oh, Avalon. Have you played Resistance Avalon or Resistance? Mm, okay. It's like those. <laughs> it's a game of uh, intrigue, lying, and like talking your way out of situations. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds it's like actually... I call it mafia, probably. Might. Yeah, I haven't tried it, but it was quite fun. The students got into it quite 
like really got into it <laughs> so it was quite fun to watch oh there's a question here. do you do longer term studies possibly return to a game a month later or longer see how much language has been retained ha 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 that's wild i've never done that that would be good though that would be a study holy crap thanks yeah should definitely give it a try right i'm gonna wrap it up then uh that was an hour i hope that's okay uh thank you so much for coming out um, and if you'd like to present yourselves, I'm going to, again, just taking on the old ALT Agora stuff here. Like, if you're interested in presenting and, and talking about your own context and what you do, um, let us know. Um, you can reply to the email I sent earlier today, which is contact at llpjournal.org, uh, or you can message me on Discord or something. And yeah, we'll, we'll try and get another one of these webinars, maybe from a different context with different students, different kind of games. I'm very happy to help. So yeah. Mm -hmm.